welcome to all of you who are just joining. Um, my name is Claire Malamed, the CEO of the Global Partnership. Um, there's a, the numbers are rapidly going up, so we're just going to sit tight until um, everyone has managed to connect and then I'll do proper introductions um, and we'll kick off at probably in a, another minute or two. But thank you all very much for joining. Those of you who are here already, um, in a moment, my colleague Karen is going to put in the uh, Zoom chat box the link to a Slido, which we're going to be using to uh, ask questions and um, also um, encourage you to provide us with some information um, that, can, that will help the report writers. Um, so while we're waiting to begin, just please do click on that link and familiarise yourself with Slido, those who haven't used it before. Um, it's incredibly useful. I can strongly, if you go into Slido at the top of the blue bar on the top, there's a Q&A tab and a polls tab. If you click on the polls tab, you get some questions and requests for information. And if you click on the Q&A, that is, that, that is where you can type your question and strongly encourage you to type questions that occur to you as people are talking. Um, and you can also indicate um, of the questions that other people have asked, if, any, if you're particularly interested in any of them, please do indicate. And then uh, this is the second time that we're running this consultation. Last time we had far too many questions um, to, for, to get to each one. So it was incredibly helpful for me as the moderator to see which were the ones that people were particularly interested in. And then I was able to make sure that they, um, that they were the ones that I put to the, to the various panelists. So in a moment, I will just, um, I'll explain in a minute the, uh, the agenda for today so that I, you only have to hear it once. Karen, perhaps you can indicate to me when uh, you think that we can start. Nice to see some familiar names on the attendance list. Hello to everybody. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening for some of us. Um, welcome to this consultation on the World Bank's World Development Report on Data for Development. I'm particularly, I'm happy to be doing this for, well, at least two reasons, probably more, that two um, to start. One, of course, is that you know, we firmly here at GPFCD, we firmly believe that uh, consultation is essential to get good and that, that the hive mind is the best mind um, and to get uh, effective analysis and useful insights. It's best to solicit the views of many different people from different parts of the world and institutions and perspectives. So we're delighted that so many of you were able to join and take part in this. And of course, um, particularly delighted to be doing this for the World Bank's World Development Report on Data for Development. That's absolutely the heart of, of what we do at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. So extremely delighted that the bank has made the very wise choice to make the, uh, the World Development Report on the topic of, uh, of data for development this year. Um, I'm very happy to be, uh, to be helping in our small way with this consultation. Uh, let me also particularly welcome Haishan Fu, who is the director of the Data for Development Group at the World Bank and has really spearheaded a lot of the thinking um, in the bank on this issue. Uh, very glad that you could join us and hope you find the discussion useful this afternoon. Well, it's my afternoon, your morning. Um, so the format for today um, is in a, in a very short moment, I will hand over to the authors of the report who will give us a brief uh, run through of the the topics that they particularly want to focus on, the overview of the report, um, and uh, just to give everyone a sort of quick, uh, a quick overview for those of you who haven't managed yet to read the uh, read the concept note. Um, I'm then going to ask uh, some discussants. Um, we've got three discussants standing by who I'll introduce in a moment to um, 
to give their perspectives um, and really sort of start to open up the discussion around some of the key topics and issues in the concept note and in the area of data for development more broadly. As I say, very much hope that you will all participate in this conversation via the Slido. For those of you who can't, for whatever reason, click through to the Slido, please do use the Zoom chat box. We want to make sure that everyone can contribute. Okay, so um, with that, let me start us off by um, inviting the co-directors and the manager of the World Development Report team. And we're very happy to have everybody here today. So Bob Carl, Vivian Foster, Dean Jolliffe, and uh, Malar Virapan, who's going to, uh, who are go I'm not sure which of you are going to be uh, presenting today, but, um, but please over to the team to, uh, to talk us through the, uh, the outline of the report. Hi, Claire, and um, everybody who's on the call. I just want to take a minute to uh, welcome everybody, everybody for taking the time to participate. Uh, we're really excited to be here. Uh, Claire, I think we'll follow the same format as the previous session. Um, and I would like to first invite uh, Bob, the Dean, and then Vivian for us to make the presentation. A quick overview for the first 15 minutes. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, I'm Bob Call. I'm one of the co-directors, as Malar said, and as Claire said. Uh, we're going to get this presentation up for you in a second. And, and again, just to reiterate, thank you so much for spending your time. The contributions we got in the first webinar were so helpful to us as we go about drafting this report. And I'm expecting this session to be just as valuable to us. Um, so, uh, as Claire said, I mean, the 2021 WDR is on data for better lives. Um, and it's coming. Um, and I'm going to try to get through this more quickly than I did the first time uh, to save time for my colleagues and to get your feedback, which is more important. So this is just a slide with various facts and figures that showing that there's been an explosion, a proliferation of data that's coincided with gra rapid growth of the digital economy, and that it's been led by the private sector. Next slide. But a question that we ask uh, the foundation of the court is at the foundation of the report is, you know, how much of a difference is that made to the poorest in the world, the 700 million people, and how much could it make in terms of a difference for the 700 people in extreme poverty in most rural areas, for 900 million that don't have access to electricity, for the 3.5 billion people who are still unconnected to the internet. Um, so let's, next slide. Um, so it's, it's unquestionable the benefits of data in the digital economy have not been shared equally. And so unlike other reports, our focus is therefore squarely going to be on how data can be used to improve the lives of the poor. Um, but this poses special challenges um, with respect to poor people, um, their skill sets and experience with data it limits their ability to understand the benefits and risks associated with using data and digital applications. Their incomes are low and highly irregular in many cases, uh, which limits their ability to connect, to pay for devices and for data services. Um, many of the people that we're trying to reach work in the informal sector. Um, some of them uh, deal primarily in cash, some in barter. Um, they don't leave a digital trace of their economic activities and um, the penetration of digital transactions for that group has been, uh, it, it hasn't penetrated for that group at all. On the positive side, on the plus side, many of the poor uh, people are young and it could increase their receptivity to using new di uh, digital applications, new technologies. So that's something that could be exploited for good. Um, with respect to countries, we face challenges because our client countries tend to have small economies, which limits the scale of their data and thus the attractiveness of entry uh, for large data-driven platform businesses, for example. It also limits their negotiating power in international floor on all issues related to data. Um, many of these countries are characterized by weak governance and institutions, which may limit the complexity and efficacy of regulatory approaches. Um, that are adaptable. One size won't fit all. Um, trying to take uh, approaches that were used in advanced uh, economies and applying them uh, in other contexts might not work very well. Um, these economies also are characterized by um, relatively low productivity in small manufacturing sectors. Research is from the advanced economies has shown that it is high productivity manufacturing firms that are most likely to adopt data-based innovations. Um, so that's another disadvantage that many of our economies face. 
And these are often also high risk environments, which may limit their attractiveness for investment in, in the much needed investments in data infrastructure that must occur. So these are the challenges we face. Um, next slide. In reaching poor people and in poor countries. And throughout the report, we make a distinction um, between two types of data. Data was created for public and private purposes. Public intent data was simply collected for um, development objectives for the public good, often by governments. Um, this is a caricature. Um, it's often survey based, but there's administrative data. There are other sources, but it's tended, it tends to be reflective of the population as a whole, but it gets collected less frequently. And there's often big lags in between the times in which these surveys are collected. Um, on the other hand, private intent data was collected with commercial purposes in mind. It's reflected, therefore, of the people using these services, often digital users. Its advantages include that it can be highly granular, it's frequently in instantaneous, and it's potentially, you can get potentially continuous feedback. So one of the themes that runs throughout the uh, report is that sort of the strengths on the left-hand side of the picture are the weaknesses on the right-hand side and vice versa. And therefore, gaining greater operability across these two types could create synergies that could be used to improve development outcomes. Um, next slide. So we recognize the challenges in reaching the poor and uh, the distinct challenges that public and private intent data pose. And yet we still feel that there's much promise for uh, using data to improve the lives of the poor. And so our report is uh, guided by a conceptual framework that points to three channels or pathways through which benefits of data um, can manifest into better development outcomes. Uh, through the top pathway uh, data, much of it generated by citizens themselves, uh, can be used by individuals in civil society, uh, bringing greater uh, transparency to processes, governmental processes, which can foster voice among individuals in uh, civil society and greater accountability on um, part of governments, leading to better development outcomes. Um, in addition, governments through the middle pathway are collecting data, more and more data on individuals through various uh, different um, sources. Uh, that data can be used to provide better evidence of policy impact, which can lead to better policy making and better service delivery. So, um, so there's a channel through which development outcomes improve. And then finally, through the bottom pathway, we think of data as a new factor of production in, um, uh, for firms with data-driven business models. Um, as a new factor of production, um, data leads to innovation and um, this uh, helps support growth. And so this is the growth channel through which the um, data can improve development outcomes. Um, the, through the middle, we have um, an important part of our framework is about reuse, which is central to our theory of change. Uh, these are the two-way arrows in the middle of the diagram. So for example, data collected for commercial purposes could be, be potentially reused and repurposed to inform policy and improve development outcomes. And again, the two-way arrow between the private firms and government in the middle of the diagram there is therefore used to indicate reuse of private intent data by government for policy purposes. It can go the other way. Um, public intent data can be used by firms to improve their growth and their productivity. So again, reuse, repurposing, um, um, combining data types is central to our story, our, our theory of change. Um, next slide, I'll try to be very brief on this one. So data can have positive development linkages, but we're fully aware uh, that there's a dark side. There are risks and challenges that we need to be fully cognizant of as we pursue these opportunities. Um, and so uh, to avoid negative outcomes, negative uh, development outcomes, um, we, we need to employ enablers and safeguards, which my uh, colleagues will talk about more. Um, but just I won't go through the details on this. Let's just go through the middle. When governments collect more data on individuals, they can monitor the population perhaps too closely. Um, and citizens' data could potentially be abused to rig elections for political motivated surveillance or to discriminate against segments of the population. So there are risks that we need to be aware of. And we try to strike the right balance throughout the report, uh, potentially positive development linkages and potentially negative and how we guard against those. Um, so, to this point in the simple framework, we've sort of assumed that there are data out there that can be used to improve development outcomes, but the availability of those data is, is shaped by the environment in which they are created. And so I'll hand off to my colleague, Dean, to begin discussing factors that aid in the creation, collection, and sharing of data 
while at the same time protecting that data from misuse. Dean? Great, thanks very much, Bob. So uh, next slide. So this notion that Bob brought up the context and environment as being central issues and how data can be better used to improve lives is really central to the storyline of the report. We'll be highlighting essentially what features of a healthy data environment work to enable the use of data for the public good and at the same time what safety measures are needed to prevent the misuse of that data. So an, an important distinction that we'll be drawing in this report is that in both the conceptual framework and through the focus on enablers and safeguards and, and frankly the examples that we'll be drawing on, it's, it's going to be much more than just a call for more data. It's really going to be a focusing on the systems that create the more effective reuse, purpose, repurposing of data for improving the lives of people. So even in countries where data is abundant, uh, it's frequently the case that the right data is just not available to answer the, the relevant sort of policy question. And that right data can just mean that maybe the right questions weren't asked, there wasn't enough um, the data, the quality of the data is not good enough, or the right sort of questions haven't been posed, or the right people haven't been asked. Certain subgroups have been ignored from, from the sampling frame and aren't represented in the data. Or it could be that the data exists, but there's just no protocol for sharing. It sits in one ministry and others don't have access to it. And those are the people who need access to it. So the researchers, civil society, or other ministries to make the right sort of policy decisions. And so we're really gonna be focusing on these issues of how do we help improve that sort of flow of data and how do we help improve the systems and the architecture that allow for that reuse of data. Um, at the same time, as data gets more uh, used and reused, it's also gonna mean that it has more potential for being misused. So we wanna articulate the safeguards that are needed for uh, preventing this. So next slide. To help move forward this idea of uh, enabling improved data systems with the appropriate safeguards, we're going to focus on two key attributes of data. So the first is that data can be used and reused without using it up, so it's a non-rival good. Um, because it's non-rival, the impact that that data can have on improving people's life is really a function of how it's been used in the past and how it might be repurposed or reused for future use. And so in that way, its value is sort of unknown, untapped in many ways. and uh, this enabling the reuse can be just as simple as ensuring that it flows more easily to users, uh, so within government, researchers, and the public, but it also means that it's created in such a way that it can be more easily overlaid with other data sources so that it's interoperable with other data sources. And the basic point here, and I think sort of recognized by all of us here, is that but given that most policy issues are complex, multidimensional problems, it's frequently going to be the case that the, that the important questions are best answered through multiple data sources laid over each other and merged together. But as soon as you lay data over each other, the issues of data protection become all the more complex. So data that's been protected or de-identified in one dimension may all of a sudden become uh, unprotected as soon as it's overlaid with multiple data sources. And so this issue of uh, the careful protection of the data becomes more complex and more demanding, and that will require a fairly significant human capital investment. A second economic attribute of the data that we'll uh, use to leverage some of our storyline is that data by nature exhibits increasing returns to scale. So at one end, an implication of this is that it suggests there's a minimum efficient scale and that for some uh, uh, lower income countries or low population countries, they may be operating well below that scale. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, increasing returns to scale means that there are significant incentives uh, essentially encouraging the concentration of data and the resulting adverse effects that one um, uh, observes through monopoly forces. Uh, this can occur uh, primarily uh, because data is an easily excludable good. So uh, next slide. So the report aims to provide guidance on how best to facilitate the effective use and safe use of the data and how to help countries attain these efficient scales while preventing adverse effects from market concentration. This slide is a dense slide. I'm only gonna talk about a couple attributes of it we're really trying to drill down in just one particular example here, and it's thinking about national data system. So we will be talking a lot about private data as well, but here, this is a figure that's a bit more focused on data that's collected for public policy, collected by typically by public, but also civil uh, society organizations. And the basic idea here is we have data in the center of this, not to suggest that it has to be centralized sitting uh, in, in one uh, central agency, 
but this notion that it's central to the decision-making process of government. And to make it central to the decision-making of government, it means that it has to be able to flow to various ministries. So the Ministry of Education needs to have access to data from the Ministry of Health. And that's the primary point that we're trying to get across here. There's also this notion though, that it is intending to suggest that protecting and enabling the flow of data is a pretty intense, uh, high demanding, uh, high skill demanding activity. And that sort of work is not something that should be re replicated. That sort of skill set isn't something that should be replicated across 10 different points within a government. There's a lot of value and uh, a lot of returns to scale in having that skill set uh, uh, um, uh, working on all of the major sort of data issues there. Another point that we're trying to sort of illustrate in this figure are the, uh, the circles, the red dashes and the green dashes here. We think that's really a central element of many data systems that we see missing in many of our counterpart um, uh, countries that we work with. And what we're trying to convey there is this notion that with the red, this, this idea that there are safeguards imposed so that there are some safe, there are some data that say some health data that truly should not be shared with other ministries. And so there needs to be certain protections of de-identification data so that even as it flows to other government counterparts, it's protected, the, the identity is protected of individuals. But by and large, most data should be flowing to other ministries and also out to the public. So we should be looking for enablers that allow citizens to get complete access to data, journalists to get access to data, research data center, academics, the private sector should be having access to data. And this should be data that's been made safe. Um, it should be fully de-identified de data. Um, but we really need to work more to enhance the flow of data out to, um, to the public for the use of these uh, data to improve public policy, because that's really fundamental to improving the dialogue, the trust, the credibility of the data, and also to improving uh, public policy underpinning it. So this is just one example where we're drilling down on the public data system. I'm gonna hand it off to Vivian, who's gonna talk uh, generally about sort of attributes that we think are important in data systems in general and concerns with data systems. And I will hand it over to Vivian to continue on. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Dean. Uh, so I'd like to talk uh, more about the enablers and safeguards that are needed in the environment for data to be able to flow. And the report is going to be looking at four different uh, types of, uh, of four pillars, if you like, of the data environment, the data governance environment. The first one is data infrastructure, where we're referring to the physical infrastructure, uh, but also the soft infrastructure, the software and the, the systems that are needed uh, in order for there to be effective access to data. Um, and here we are particularly concerned about issues of equity. We're concerned about equity within countries because we know that there's a significant digital divide and a, a lot of uh, people still don't have access to the internet, uh, therefore to the benefits of that data and their own data is not captured either through the internet. Um, so we'll be looking at some of the constraints to universal access, including some of the supply side challenges, the need to upgrade towards 5G uh, capabilities, uh, but also the many persistent demand side uh, issues like affordability and literacy that prevent uh, poorer populations from taking advantage of the in in internet even when it's physically present. We'll also be looking at uh, the data divide between uh, rich and poor countries um, and observing that many low-income countries actually rely exclusively on overseas infrastructure for the internet, whether it's data uh, storage, data centers, cloud uh, computing capacity, or even internet, basic internet exchange has to go routed through the international network. Um, and so we'll be trying to understand the economics of you know, when and how uh, poor countries can develop their own data infrastructure to improve the cost, uh, speed, uh, reliability, and capacity of their access to data. We'll also be looking at safeguards, uh, including cybersecurity and privacy enhancing technologies. The second pillar is laws and regulations. Um, there will be uh, considering how uh, laws and regulations can enable the flow of data uh, through uh, provisions related to transparency, openness, uh, interoperability, portability, uh, but also the safeguards where we'll be distinguishing between a personally identifiable viable data where a uh, human rights framework will be used to consider the appropriate forms of data protection, um, as well as non-personal data where the um, approach will be more founded on intellectual property rights. Um, in 
throughout this discussion of laws and regulations, we'll be differentiating between what applies at the national level, uh, um, plus uh, what additional or different types of provisions may be needed to enable and safeguard the flow of data across international borders. The third pillar is economic policy, and here we'll be recognizing that decisions taken about the, the regulatory framework for data will have important knock-on implications for the real economy um, in three key areas, competition policy, trade, and taxation. Under competition policy, we'll be concerned about concentration of market power and how data portability may be a strategy for fostering competition. Uh, under trade, we'll be looking at the relationship between data protection and data protectionism. Uh, and how countries can uh, balance uh, their concerns about data with their desire to participate in the growing area of cross-border trade in data goods and services as well as electronic commerce. And data taxation will be considering uh, the fact that um, database businesses may be particularly um, able to uh, evade tax liabilities uh, because of, the, of their mobility across borders and their ability to be present uh, in a market without having a physical uh, location. Uh, and we'll be uh, discussing in all of these areas, um, the cross-border, the need for uh, cross-border coordination in regulatory uh, frameworks uh, that affect each of these three key areas of economic policy. And finally, under institutions and governance, we'll be uh, considering what kind of institutions are needed to fulfill the enabling and safeguarding roles that have been described uh, above. Uh, we'll be considering to what extent there's a need to repurpose existing institutions, such as the national statistical agencies, or to create new ones, such as data protection authorities or data intermediaries um, that may be needed for the, to fulfill some of these roles. We recognize that there's no single institutional model for data governance and that uh, the model that any particular country adopts needs to be sensitive to the maturity uh, uh, of the governance framework in, in that particular context. We'll also be emphasizing a multi-stakeholder approach to data governance that looks at the whole ecosystem and considers the role of society and private sector players alongside government. Thank you very much, Vivian. Uh, Mala, were you going to uh, come in or are we... Um, can I hand over to the discussants now? Uh, um, okay. Please hand over to the discussions, uh, Claire. I'll come in during the question and uh, answer session. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Really, as you can hear um, from the presentation, a huge amount um, to think about there. Very, very comprehensive look across the issues. So in order to help us with our sort of thinking, we've invited uh, three discussants to kick off, to offer us their views um, and perspectives and comments and kick off the discussion. Um, we've already got some really good comments on the Slido, just to give you a flavor, um, a point about um, the, the distinction between official and unofficial or independent citizen generated data, the need for uh, the need to think about unofficial or you know, non-government data, particularly where official data is unavailable or politicised. Um, focus on human rights, very important. Um, a, um, a point about capacity building um, and, um, and also a plea for a bit more um, clarity of definitions. So we may uh, come back to some of those points in the discussion now or in, the, um, in a moment. But let me first um, hand over to, uh, to Deepa Karthikian, who is the co-founder and director of Athena Infonomics based in DC, um, a member of our technical advisory group here at the Global Partnership. Uh, Deepa, over to you. Great, thank you so much, Claire. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you um, today uh, in this webinar. Uh, it's a fascinating topic. I enjoyed reading the report. My congratulations to the, the co-directors and um, Malavri, the manager, for having sort of really touched upon so many different aspects to this, this conversation in, in, a, in a single place. Um, and thanks, Claire, for having me um having me here uh, so i so i athena and phenomics and i want to start there because what we do is we get we get paid to use traditional and non-traditional data we collect and collate those data that i come from uh, that's and i think that background is important to help contextualize a lot of what i'm going to share 
uh, as part of this webinar this morning. Um, just by virtue of, because that's what we do, a lot of my work has been in the urban space because it's, it's a proximity to the data because the, the, the data divide and, and, and I, I think somebody brought up this interesting point of data and digital and, and distinguishing between the two and I, I think that's an important one. The data divide and of course the digital divide as well between urban and rural. I'm going to step outside my comfort zone a little bit even though all of my work has been in urban but talk about uh, a problem I haven't worked with as much directly but I know several of my colleagues who have consistently faced in this, this really um, day on the rural poor. Uh, I think I, I, I want to start with that really because I think that that's something we need. We shouldn't just talk about at a high level, but we should talk about specifically because, and I, I feel like that's also an area we need a little more detailing in the report as well. Uh, because a lot of the, the assumptions we make about the kinds of data sets we can access, we can't when it comes to the rural poor. And the, the latest sort of the SDG update clearly shows that we're leaving the rural poor behind the most uh, when it comes to eradicating extreme poverty. And the ones that are getting left behind are just getting harder to reach. Uh, and, and several of us know, I don't, I don't want to go into the details, obviously, because rurality is intersects with several other kinds of marginalization, right? Uh, one cost, gender, ethnicity, and uh, these are spatial poverty types. Uh, so I'd like to reflect on one key point there and think about, therefore, where does our data come from? When we think about rural poor, what how do we know what's happening in the rural poor and where do governments get that data from? And if, if you reflect on that point, you see that the data mostly comes from MISO sort of intermediate agencies that have frontline. So it could be frontline health workers, it's rural cooperatives, it's, uh, it's, it's agencies that are mostly governments or that, working in or it's rural local governments, working in rural contexts. Deepa, yes. you're you're breaking up quite a lot, so Karen's just oh. going to turn off your video. Um, I let talking. me try and do that and see if this is better. Is is this better? Can you hear me better now? I apologize. Very much better. Thank you. Sorry to oh. interrupt your train of okay. thought. Okay. Oh no, no, no problem at all. Apologies for that. So, I, I, just to go back, and I think that when we think about where data on the rural poor come from, I think uh, the, at the heart of it, we see it's mostly agencies, it's, it's rural local governments, it's cooperatives, it's frontline health workers. Um, and consistently we see one thing that's missing across all of these groups, which is they don't treat data producers as data consumers. And I feel that it, that's at the heart of the rural data problem for us as we've observed it, which is it, on the, more, the, the obvious argument of Yes, we wanted to use the data because it's, they make a difference, but we see serious data quality challenges because data producers are not data consumers. Uh, the, the quality of data that's going into health management information systems, just as an example, uh, and this perhaps is one of the more long-standing uh, systems, national systems of data collection uh, that most countries enjoy, both developed and developing, and Despite that long history, we see that we see the system still consistently suffering from data quality issues. And uh, at the heart of that pro problem, and I'm happy to talk talk to that talk about that more specifically in the QA, but is the problem of not empowering data producers and incentivizing data producers to also be data consumers. Uh, the second point that I wanted to make, just as a quick reflection, and I don't want to take too much, because really the, the joy of being on this webinar is the discussion. So I just wanted to make one other point, really from my own experience, um, which is, I think this, 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 era, this notion of public, the national statistical agencies as being custodians of data is somewhat outdated. Uh, more data, for instance, in, the, in, 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 for example, in a lot of the South Asian context that I worked in personally, more data gets generated more frequently outside of the National Statistical Agency in the line ministries and departments. Uh, and 
these large ministries and departments and and Dean, you mentioned this that I, you talked about a one national data system. Uh, I feel like just from my experience, the biggest gap for me on the institutional side is that there is nobody within these ministries that has the skills and resources to think about data and data governance. And what I think also conversations where we talk about building data stewards, data trusts outside government uh, that can empower government to do this, to, to deliver on their role uh, on the data side more effectively. But my experience just is a little different. We, if you don't have dedicated person, a data officer or a steward that's embedded within a line ministry that can think about questions of data sharing, data protection, data interoperability, and then interact with other line ministries. And if that officer is not of a reasonable level of seniority, we'll never go the needle. Because what you will end up doing is sort of just creating another institution, like a national statistical agency that's outside ministries. Uh, those are sort of two big reflections that I just, just wanted to open with. Um, most happy to talk uh, about some of this or other things that come up through, through the Q&A, but uh, I really enjoyed reading the report. Thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Deepa. Apologies for the quality um, there. We'll see if uh, Karen can work with Deepa to, um, to get a better connection um, so that you can uh, hear her a little better. But I think uh, the, the critical points there were both really um, important and relevant. One is about um, the, the role, of, really both about the role of different um, institutions of government here and the role of uh, data collectors within um, health posts and so on and understanding, building kind of capacity and understanding among those organizations about the, uh, the value of the data and therefore the importance of quality and so on. And then this question, uh, back to this question that we discussed uh, also in the first uh, webinar about um, the role of national statistical offices um, and the changing role of different government institutions um, and how to create, how to make sure that the, the sort of capacity and incentives exist in the right places in government to build that integrated system that, that you're talking about. Thank you so much, um, Deepa, for that. Um, so let me hand over now to... Uh, to Aidan, the Aidan Nerkuse, who is the Executive Director of Twaweza, uh, a member of our uh, GPSDD board also. Um, Aidan, there's a lot of questions come up on Slido that will be uh, right up your street. So we've already heard a bit about, we've already heard from Ben Taylor, hi Ben, on um, the importance of citizen generated data. Um, also a question here about the human rights framework and the relevance of a human rights framework. Um, and then um, about um, the transparency of data, algorithmic transparency, and so on. We'll come back to some of these questions, but just to give you a uh, to give you a flavour um, and an interesting conversation also emerging about uh, data use and incentives for data use that we will definitely come back to as a separate issue under the uh, on when we um, come back to the conversation. But Aidan, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Dar es Salaam. Um, thank you very much. I want to just take off from where I heard Deepa making an initial point <clears throat> uh, about the rural uh, data, about the rural poor. Uh, but I want to make sort of the much broader point because that, that's a really important one. Um, in, in the earliest webinar, I'm lucky to have attended both. The Poor World Bank team has to listen to this uh, again, but I'll nuance it slightly. In the earlier seminar, um, Lisa Bersales from Philippines said, uh, he quoted uh, uh, Ms. Fiorina's quote at the beginning of the, of the uh, statement about data turning into information and to insight. And I just want to add that this insight allows us to then imagine a better world, a better way of delivering uh, um, services, uh, improving people's lives as the report is wanting uh, to do. But one thing that I want to just stress again is that uh, data doesn't just come out of the vacuum. It's produced by people, it's about people, and it's for people. So in that framework, the conceptual framework, let's put the people back and maybe replace the word data with people and then maybe data underneath it with, in terms of, you know, in parentheses. Um, and I think this is the point that Deepa 
was making uh, about some invisible people. Um, the rural, uh, uh, rural populations are not well treated, I think, in this concept of anything, and it's absolutely vital um, that they are. Um, I, I, I remember reading, I can't remember where, that if you are not at the table, then you are on the menu. And I really don't want this report to put uh, ordinary people on the menu. They need to be at the table consuming that which they have produced through their own activity, through their own consumption patterns, through their own engagement with one another and with government. They need to then consume it to improve their own, a better understanding of, of what is surrounding them and what is shaping their lives and to better then use them, uh, the data to, to make uh, life um, uh, better. So I think in that, in that framework, I won't go into the other uh, elements of the framework, but let's really put the people uh, at the center. I think this speaks to the issue more uh, um, and we just touch on the issue around uh, the rights of the human beings who are producing and generating this data uh, to use it, uh, data rights, digital rights. They create a lot of economic value, I think, as Vivian uh, alluded to, but that value is captured by a very few um, firms, um, individuals, etc. So how can had that value then be generated, whether directly through, through some kind of compensation, if you can imagine such a thing, or improvements really in access, in services, in, 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 um, in productivity that makes their life better, lowers the cost of, of living for them in one way uh, or another. I think that's, that's one point. The other one I'd like to make, and Dean, I really, I was listening very carefully to what you were saying there, uh, and talk about the national data system. And I think you made a, a, um, a great statement in the fact that we're not saying that the national statistics offices coordinate, I mean, you know, monopolize everything but that they play a central role in terms of providing a skill set for all of government to access, to be able to understand what the data is about. I think that is really, really important. If we can find a way to be categorical about in this report that we're not asking national data systems providers to be gatekeepers and to monopolize the production and the publication of data, that would be exceedingly important guidance with far reaching implementation. So if, if we can make that point nice and strongly with good, good examples, uh, it would be useful. I mean, I had the, the pleasure of visiting the, the Office of National Statistics uh, in the UK a few years ago, and I was just blown away by how they see themselves as a service provider for government, for government to make better decisions. Other NSOs tend to play a much more constrictive, restrictive, gatekeeping role as to what is and isn't kosher. Uh, depending on the politics of the country. So if you can make that really, really uh, important point um, in the report, would be fantastic. Um, and maybe just um, a note on the citizen-generated data. Civil society um, has very, very many multiple faces, but one of them is the ability to get at the truth uh, of citizens in a way that national governments or national statistics offices or official or administrative data misses. And so this um, role that citizens, civil society organizations can play needs to somehow be examined, maybe validated uh, in, the, in the report um, so that there, the notion that citizen generated data or civil society's uh, um, uh, production of data is somewhat second or third class. Um, that, you know, first is the statistical offices, second is the private sector, and then maybe in third class comes the, the citizen um, civil society. I think, I think we should try and really showcase the importance of civil society generated data for policy. And I know in the concept note it says this report is going to be really geared towards communicating and talking to and persuading policy and decision makers. If you can amplify this point, it would give us a lot of um, I won't use the word ammunition, but persuasive power when we talk to our own policymakers about the importance of the work uh, that we do. So let me, let me stop here. Thank you, Claire. Thank you so much, Aidan. Um, a huge amount to, uh, to think about there. Um, and I think this point about the sort of the, very much resonates with the questions that we're getting on the Slido, this point about the sort of institutional frameworks that guide the work of the NSO. And in particular, I think we've already talked a little bit about institutional frameworks. There's a question about um, whether the legal and regulatory frameworks are kind of up to the job 
Um, and then there's also a lot of interest, I'm going to come back to this um, after we've heard from um, Anna Patricia, on disaggregated data and the extent to which data kind of reflects existing structural inequalities um, and also the extent to which data can help to overcome those inequalities. So I'm going to just to give all the panellists fair warning, I'm going to come back to, to that as the first topic um, for discussion because that um, seems to be of great interest to, to many of our participants here. But first of all, let me um, invite Anna Patricia Munoz, who is the Executive Director of Grupo Faro based in Ecuador, to, uh, to come in and um, please, Anna Patricia, give us your perspectives on the discussion so far. Um, and the, the concept note and presentation. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you for the invitation. This is a topic that's very much at the core of what Grupo Faro does. Um, Grupo Faro is a think tank based in Ecuador, uh, but we belong to more than 20 international networks and we are delighted to be here today. I was gonna end my five minute um, speech by the point that Aidan made, so <laughs> he stole the thunder. Uh, because so, so I'm going to mix it a little bit and, and turn it around because I think what he ended saying I'm going to begin with now uh, it's so important and I even after reading the concept note uh, I thought maybe I just read it too quickly I'm going to just control find the word um, civil society the word NGOs and see how it's, its role is depicted and and indeed it, it's mentioned several times, but it's mentioned more in my view um, as, a, as, a, as a channel, as a user, but not necessarily as a producer of data. And I think that's very important. So I would dedicate a whole entire section about what Aidan mentioned, which is citizens generated data through um, the active participation of call it what you want, think tanks, civil society organization, NGOs, because I think more and more that's becoming um, a way of collect data in a more useful, but also more active, uh, a more present way. So uh, that was going to be my conclusion. Now I'm going to start with, with that. Uh, and I think we, I'm seeing the comments. I think there's several comments that agree with that. Um, so I, I wanted to start uh, and let me see, check my, my, time because there's a lot to talk about. Um, so my perspective will be a mix of what I saw in my previous job uh, working at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. I was um, the director of the community development uh, research group there. And again, taking on Aidan's uh, point or your point, Claire, about inequalities in the data in of itself. I think, uh, for example, a clear example is, cre is credit scores, uh, how credit scores data, which is huge, like Equifax, for example, there's, for researchers, I mean, it's a dream to use that data, millions of millions, almost entire US population in that data, but how the credit scores, right, are um, created uh, in an environment that has inequalities in it. Um, is very important to consider. So I, I thought your point was very good. Um, so I'm going to start just mentioning two research and, and data collection that I think change the way we see um, development and economic development. Then I'm going to, if you, I may mention two or three initiatives that were currently implemented at Grupo Faro, and then uh, end with a few reflections um, that I think complement with, with what Deep and Aiden said. Um, so first, uh, one phrase that I'm going to um, quote, um, not exactly, but that the sense is the same that I always use in my presentations, kind of justifying why um, I love working with data and, and research, uh, is one by the economist Kenneth Galbraith, who said that societies don't become effectively interested in, in solving social problems until they're able to measure them. So I think measure social problems really is not only interesting, but it's key to solving social problems. And um, two examples that, that I was mentioning is one on the um, um, portfolios of the poor, you know, this is a project that was implemented um, by several researchers uh, led by NYU uh, in, in three countries, I think it was Bangladesh, South Africa and India, um, and they collected data, very detailed data on how poor families use sophisticated financial products, um, up, up to 14 financial products to, to survive and and save and take credit. And then that was um, replicated in, in New York, actually, and other places in the US with the financial diaries. And that really showcased the importance of collecting detailed data and paying attention from the voices of um, uh, 
poor families. And that, I think, changed a, a lot of uh, policies uh, and, and approaches, not only to credit, but to savings. That's, that's one, I think, example of how data has changed the way we see policies. Um, another, um, I think, you know, realm of work is, is the behavioral economics, uh, which has a lot of criticisms as well, but I think provides some tool about how really understanding how decisions are made can help also influence public policy and how we implement um, good decisions. So that's kind of a quick examples of how uh, just emphasizing the importance of, of, of your report and the importance of, of research in this, in this space. Um, so we'd like to provide now two or three examples of what we're doing at Grupo Faro. We actually did have, um, we just finished up a project uh, called Citizens Generate Data for, uh, for SDGs uh, with the support of the German Corporation. And what we did is we chose the SDG 11 on cities and urban development and used a tool that's called um, the Cobo Toolbox and asked five cities, uh, citizens in five cities to collect that data. Uh, and that way we can measure, we can take the pulse on the priorities of people uh, are feeling, but also on how they see the SDGs and how, and how the, the, those cities can meet them. So we are constantly implemented this idea of generating data from citizens using different tools, both online and offline. So I think that that was an example. We've also implemented um, observatories using um, official data and also non-official data, uh, again, kind of tracking what's happening with SDGs in Ecuador and everything we do in alliance with, the, with other NGOs, with the public sector when we can and with local officials. So I don't wanna um, overwhelm you with more examples of what we're doing. Uh, let me just end by one more, which is, we, and, and I saw it in the report, um, this idea of geo-referencing, so having maps with geolocations. Um, and I thought that was a very good point in the report in that, more and more we have the capacity to visualize what is happening where and that you can include um, citizens to include their pictures or their ideas in those maps that can also visualize and make it very real i think now the covid19 pandemic has shown us how important it is to get micro to get uh, you know special um, spatial uh, geo reference in the maps that we're using i think that's going to be um very important now just um to, to, to close um, my, my opening statement and kind of get again to the feedback, um, more directly to the feedback on the concept note. Um, again, this is something that I saw it, but maybe deserves more attention, is that qualitative data, uh, the use of qualitative data, how we handle it. Uh, I think qualitative data has been undervalued and I love to see more of that and how we can standardize processes to really um, lift the importance of qualitative data. Um, also, the, the mention of administrative data, it's important, has a great potential in countries like Ecuador, where we're collecting an enormous amount of data by governmental organizations. And there's a lot of potential to do matches and do cross-sectional and also timeline, um, time series. And I think there's a lot of that can be done there. Um, something that, again, I, I saw a little bit in the report, which was the importance of funding data collection. But I think it's very important to emphasize the that these um, governmental agencies that collect data have to be independent. I'm very concerned about what I'm seeing in some countries, including Ecuador, that there may be some risk that that, that independence is um, in danger. And once you lose trust on that data, you know, I think there's not much to be done. So I love to see a little bit more of that in the, in the report as well. Um, Finally, I think it's interesting also um, to mention the international standards that combine this active uh, data collection and systematization and standardization, um, but also uh, it, to promote transparency. So in Ecuador, Grupo Fire is part of um, several core groups on the EITI, that's the um, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, on the OGP, the Open Government, and we follow, of course, the news from the data, Open Data Charter. So I think that, again, mentioning how international standards are changing how developing countries and developed countries see the data collection and the role of civil society in it, I think it's important. Um, so because the CSO's point was made in the beginning, I won't repeat it again. 
what dangers I find in addition or um, to emphasize what's been said in the context. Thank you, Anna. If you, can make this your, if you can make this your last point, that would be great. There'll be time to come back in again um, sure. in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was actually the last point. I thank you for, so much for, for taking the time. So uh, data mining, I think, is a danger. And, and also, again, not having standards that can um, allow us to compare data across countries and, and regions. It's a danger of having so much data. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for really interesting examples. Um, and I think, you know, I think what you all focused on is I think really coming back to Aidan's point about putting people very squarely in the center of this, whether that be through a focus on data that comes directly through citizen generated data and people expressing their own realities in data, or whether as in Deepa's example, we're talking about the kind of specific ways in which the data on those very poorest and most remote communities is, um, is collected. Um, so I wanted, let me just switch my video on so you can see me while I'm talking. Um, I wanted to just now um, run down a few of the questions that have been um, where that uh, also on this topic, which have come in from our participants and then come back to the bank team um, and just see kind of if you can provide us with a bit more information on how that is, is being tackled. So I think there's a there's a real focus in some of the questions about thinking about sort of existing inequalities, whether that be uh, the question from um, from our friend Philip Thigo about the kind of structural causes of poverty and inequality and how they our data gaps are kind of reflect the inequalities in society, the people who are you know who have the least are the people about whom we know the least. Um, and then a focus on particular groups, people particularly focus on, on the people with disabilities um, and can, you know, the way in which having more data on people, um, as Anna suggested, you know, can be a tool to change those, to improve lives for those people. But you have to first go out and collect the information and that is often not done. So I wonder if uh, somebody from the bank team can just come back and kind of reflect a little bit of your thinking on really focusing in on this question of these various particular groups of people. What's your analysis of how we can improve data or how your report can contribute to improving data about those people? And what is the role that you see as data, particularly in playing in improving those people's lives? Thank you. I guess I can take a crack at that, if that's okay. With Bob and Vivian. Um, so, uh, Claire, I'll, I'll get in one step, I'll get to the question you posed, but I'll, I'll just start as a stepping stone with Anna's comments about trust and independence. Um, so, we do think that's incredibly important, uh, this notion of, of the public having trust in data, but also other, uh, the government having trust in data. And then the independence, the belief that the, that the data is not being manipulated in some sort of way is being really fundamental to improving policy discourse. And, and I think the step that has to come before that is the point that others are making about skills. Um, the, that skill set, that investment in the human capital to uh, effectively use and understand and co collect the right sort of data is really critical to, um, to building up the credibility of, um, of the data producers and the, and the producers of the information that comes out of the data. And so we think that's a really sort of um, critical element of the storyline. At the same time, uh, part of trust and credibility comes from creating a, a data environment that allows for the healthy competition of data. And, and so I think that means having uh, public data uh, that can be vetted by citizen, citizen generated data. Um, and the more that the system creates interoperability, so the ease of comparison of those data sources, the more that one can assess the credibility of, of essentially both those data sources. And so we'll, we'll probably avoid language along the lines of thinking of one data source as being more useful than the other data source and more along the lines of each data source having strengths and weaknesses and the joint use of the different data sources is what will build sort of a more powerful kind of storyline. And that actually links to this notion of missing populations as well. So when um, Deepa brought up this notion of the rural poor, my immediate take on the rural poor is that it's again this issue of not having the right 
data available. And, and part of that isn't necessarily that that means we need to go out and click more data as, as, and as, as Deepa indicated, data exists on this. It's just not effectively used in a way uh, that helps us to build a complete picture. And, and Deepa provided examples of, um, of uh, NGO collected data and CGD collected data, but you could also even think about metadata that exists that would help us do a much better job on thinking about rural poor. So being able to facilitate the communication between um, survey data on well-being with data on, say, for, existent, for instance, labor markets or cost of living or various sort of things that differ in rural areas significantly from capital city areas that household surveys very rarely can capture. And so our ability to talk effectively about the rural poor is really hampered by that lack of interoperability of different data sources. And probably my same answer on, I think, much of the response in terms of thinking about missing populations in the short and medium run, I think it's about being smarter about using data that currently exists. Um, I think there's a lot of potential for combining privately collected data or privately produced data, thinking about using CGD data, thinking about data collected by NGOs in combination with data that's been collected by the government to help pinpoint and to learn more about populations that have been typically um, uh, not well captured in data sources. Um, I'll just end by saying all of this is incredibly useful and, and I think much of it is, is certainly in our intention to bring out in the report, but hearing it articulated will really help us to sort of tell that storyline. And as Aidan sort of mentioned, if, if we're going to be effective, we really have to sort of nail these points strong and hard and clear. And so by us sitting and listening, it really helps us to sort of formulate that sort of messaging. So I'll take that as my message to mute here. Thank you, Dean. That's really interesting. And I just wanted to, um, okay, I'm going to ask Aidan wants to come back on this point, but what you said about interoperability leads us on to another really interesting question that's just been posed. So, but Aidan, let me uh, invite you to come back on, particularly on this inequality point first. Yes, um, partly inequality, interoperability, and CGD. Um, I, I mentioned the example earlier on in the, in the, in the first seminar <clears throat> that sometimes to get over the nervousness that could be there amongst uh, maybe government officials or uh, private sector people about the quality of citizen generated data uh, being you know, generated by people like uh, Anna Patricia or Tuaweza uh, uh, and others. Um, I think there is um, a very important contribution that can be made by those civil society organizations in sort of bridging uh, from the citizens to the official official them. Um, and I mentioned earlier, and my colleague, I know my colleague Yudi is on, on the call listening because he's been running our excellent data collection exercise just to see how teachers can be incentivized uh, to, to teach better and have the kids uh, learn basic skills. Um, and it's quite a, the data collection process has evolved from six years ago, which was very expensive, personal, one-on-one -on -one kind of data collection, to just last year when we did quite a lot of it using citizens, ordinary citizens, you know, the teachers and, and other uh, people that we are working with, to collect the data in an electronic fashion, to have it cleaned and processed really super fast. But I think the, the contribution that Tuaweza was, is, is making to this is to show that even a non-official uh, organization can produce some relatively or some very high quality data that has a deep policy implications uh, there. So there's a role for of bridge building. I think Anna Patricia was mentioning this uh, in, in her remarks between the citizens themselves who generate a very important set of their own reality and the government who want to maintain certain minimum standards of reliability and usability of data. And I think that's where the role um, um, and civil society organizations uh, can make. The, on, on the inequality piece, um, I wonder if the, 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 the report could reflect a little bit on the fact that in, in, as more people enter into the data sphere, I'm going to call it the data sphere, including rural people, such as those who are now accessing financial services, entering into the data sphere, uh, providing lots and lots of passive data in, in how they use uh, this, uh, um, but then you find that clever people in between are able to extract the value completely 
<laughs> and and alienate the value of those uh, that generated by 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 the rural poor or the urban poor or whatever. Uh, and this this doesn't go back uh, to them in in uh, you know in sufficiently. So you find that they enter the data sphere where they are milked uh, very efficiently for the value that they've created, and that can I think to Philip. Vigo's point can enhance structural inequality. Yeah? Ironically, you are structurally excluded because you're not in data. You can be mm -hmm. structurally excluded because you are generating a data that is yeah. whose value is completely extracted by somebody else. So let me let me let me stop here. Maybe the bank could Thank reflect you, on Thank you, Aiden. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Aiden. No, and actually that before I get into the operability point, that leads me on to another interesting point also made by Philip. Uh, Philip, you are a fount of good ideas uh, this afternoon um, about specifically speaking about the role of what he calls intermediaries, um, different kind of organisations. He's referencing startups, SMEs, co community based organisations and so on, who can have a role in, in a sense, being a sort of break on some of that extraction. Um, and helping to build up those data systems at a, a local um, or at least a, a, a somewhat more local level. So I don't know, um, I guess it's a question also for the bank team about, you know, who you're imagining in your data system. You talked quite a lot about that your picture of the data system includes the government entities, the different departments of government, but where in that picture that you presented would you see these kind of different intermediaries, different types of organization that can help um, to make the whole system sort of fairer in the various ways that Aidan was, uh, was describing and that several people have raised on the chat? Uh, I can take the question, Dean uh, and Bob, if that's okay. That'd be great, Malar, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Claire. I think it's a, it's a great point that uh, I think Philip uh, brought up about intermediaries. I think this is one of the things that we'll also consider in, in the way that uh, we're looking at institutional frameworks. I think when we talk about institutional frameworks, we're not just talking about state actors. We're talking about, uh, you know, everyone, you know, all type of actors involved in building this national data systems. I think in the picture that Dean uh, you know, talked about, he had, uh, I don't know if you're able to spot a few blocks which had, uh, uh, you know, the governments, but it, we also had private sector, we had media, uh, uh, we had civil society, we didn't expand, kind of, we didn't break down the functions of, uh, you know, uh, media or the civil society, but I think we were just broadly grouping uh, different types of institutional models that are emerging or the functions they play in, uh, you know, either, uh, uh, you know, in bringing, you know, either they're collecting data, uh, you know, like Aiden was talking about, uh, you know, some of the civil societies, or they are bringing together different types of, uh, you know, data data sources together to produce some kind of analysis. It's often done either by universities, but it's also done by independent think tanks. Um, or uh, the role of media, uh, the role that media plays um, uh, a lot in communicating uh, some of the insights that come out of that come from the data more broadly to a general audience, but um, and and I guess also uh, some of the newer emerging models uh, such as data trusts that are being explored, uh, you know, sort of independent fiduciary agents which can actually help with uh, curation uh, of data coming from multiple data sources. The report would kind of explore all of these different frameworks again, uh, taking a very multi-stakeholder approach. Um, I think. Uh, I think it, either in this seminar or in the previous seminar, there was this strong point that somebody brought up, brought up about this notion of N NSOs or governments alone being the gatekeep gatekeepers of, or custodians. I think we're exploring that. I mean, that's we, we are not taking that route, but we're exploring what other models are there. I think what would be more helpful is if we can hear a little bit more from uh, who's on the call, uh, or more around examples of um, the role of these intermediaries, especially in, uh, you know, in, in low and middle income countries, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how it, I mean, how does it really work, especially at the subnational levels? Uh, and what are some of the, some of the points that we should bring out in the report um, as we, you know, explore these different frameworks? Thank you, Malar. And the, the request for uh, the 
request for concrete examples is very well taken um, and there is a facility in the Slido for people to on the polls tab for people to um, input their specific examples but of those of those who are listening um, if you have particular examples that you would like us to pass on to the bank um, you can do that through us or we can put details at the end of the email address where email address where you can put in more com more uh, more comments and information and as Mala says very specific information so we have another 20 minutes left um, there are enormous number of topics that I want to come to but let me um, just uh, start with um, two and see whether we can squeeze in a third. Um, and uh, let me also encourage the other panelists, particularly Anna and Deepa, uh, if you want to come in at any point, please just use the raise hand function or leave a message in the chat and I will absolutely call on you. We want you to be part of this conversation as well. Um, so, um, there's one question that I think you know, if it links very well to the conversation we were just having about different data sources and civil society data and so on, which I think is a really interesting point from uh, Susan Aronson. Thank you, Susan, um, about standards and the various types of data being governed by a plethora of strategies, standards, principles and so on. And a, a, some, a little um, an anxiety that this might um, actually get in the way of interoperability if we see different standards emerging for different types of data. Can that actually create barriers to interoperability? And then we've also had some, uh, some interesting points about governance, which sort of both, been, you know, somewhat, which uh, link very much to, to standards and governance um, and the question of whether that does get, you know, what is the kinds of governance that can, um, provide incentives for interoperability as well as the other things that we want governments to do like transparency, um, like, like accountability um, and so on. So I think there's a sort of question here about the many different things that we increasingly expect of that rather broad term data governance um, and how you're going to be addressing that. I think the interoperability point is fascinating. I hadn't really thought about it like that in those terms before. So interested in any thoughts on that. But I think more broadly, there's a real interest in, um, in data governance um, and how that can reconcile lots of different objectives at the same time. So uh, whoever would like to come on that, thank you. And then Deepa, I'll come to you after we've heard from the bank team on this and also you, Anna, thank you. Vivian, we can't hear you. Um, oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, here, is that better? Good. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I, I think the, the whole topic of interoperability is really, really central to um, this report. While we will be putting a lot of emphasis on data protection, um, I think somebody in the chat mentioned that, you know, sometimes there's a lot of focus on the protection and people forget about the uh, the interoperability and the enablers. I think that is a balance we'd very much like to address in this report. Uh, while giving data protection its legitimate due, we want to make sure that there's uh, adequate discussion of interoperability uh, and what that means uh, and how that functions both in the legal and regulatory framework in terms of the requirements for openness, transparency, portability, interoperability, how it feeds through into the issues of the design of um, actual platforms and databases uh, in ways that facilitate interoperability, um, as well as the function of institutions in, uh, in assuring interoperability. Uh, and the, we heard a moment ago about intermediaries as being you know, one possible actor that can, can support the, the connection of different types of data together. So I just want to you know, stress that this is a, a very central topic uh, for us. Um, we, also, we also think that the interoperability can uh, help to uh, reduce some of the market power concerns that have also been uh, voiced in the context of, of data platforms. Uh, on the wider question of data governance, um, I think what we really want to convey is that we want to look at data governance in a very, very holistic and comprehensive and multidimensional manner. Um, so it's not just laws, it's not just institutions. Um, it's the interaction of, uh, you know, whole layered systems, starting with the, the foundational infrastructure, hard and soft, 
uh, than the actual legal and regulatory framework, uh, hard, you know, both the hard law and the kind of the softer law, the, the codes and the standards that different actors uh, may, may introduce. Um, uh, and then, you know, the actual institutions themselves, but not confined to the government institutions, but actually the whole ecosystem of actors um, that create the data, uh, share it and make it available, but also uh, use it, uh, put it to good use um, through the uh, analytics and processing of data to, to generate insights that might uh, support accountability and citizen issues, or might support indeed innovation and value creation on the private sector side. So it's, it's a very, very pluralistic and, and comprehensive approach uh, to the governance question. In fact, the whole second half of the report will be devoted to that. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a governance expert on the call, uh, Mike Pisa from the Centre for Global Development, who I strongly uh, recommend that you uh, follow up on with this point if you're not um, already in touch. Um, OK, Deepa, did you want to come in on this governance point? Thank you. Right. I just I'm sorry. Can you all hear me? Loud and clear. Beautifully. Awesome. Thank you. OK, great. Uh, I just so I, I think that's a great point. And I just wanted to uh, take a quick minute to reflect on, I think, Interoperability is, a, and I, Vivian made this really interesting point that I agree where intermediaries could, and thinking about market based responses where you can provide technical support for interoperability demand between data sets. And my, again, experience has been that, for example, if the health department and the water and sanitation department wants to come together and, and have their data sets speak to one another, I, I creating technical expertise that can respond to that is one approach. But my, I just want to use that data governance question as an opportunity to re reiterate the importance of having people within ministries that can anchor those conversations. Uh, and I, which, which is different from sort of this, this larger point of standards, because if you don't have people with skills who understand concepts and can work on behalf of ministries and engage with counterparts, private or public sector, um, I feel the data governance conversation is not one I'm going to advance to further on that, sorry. That is just a limited point I wanted to make. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Deepa, absolutely. And I think I strongly uh, recognize that point that although we often think about data in terms of very abstract concepts around governance regulation, you know, the sort of algorithms and so on at heart, like everything to do with governance and administration, we're talking about relationships between people and having people there is central. Um, I want, I'm going to, we have a 13 minutes left. Um, the, the next point I want to come to is this whole question of data use, which um, to some extent um, links. So Anna, Patricia, I know you want to talk about, uh, have, you know, share some thoughts with us on the capacity side. So if it's all right with you, I'm going to just sort of highlight some of the questions that have come in on the chat about um, data use and then go to you, Anna, Patricia, and then back to the bank team. Um, so there's a few questions, I think, about um, incentives to use data. Um, we we're making a big jump here about data for better lives. That doesn't happen simply by having the data. That, that happens by having the data and also using it. Um, and I think the barriers to use are many. Um, there are questions of capacity, questions of funding, as we've already heard, uh, questions of politics. Um, the uh, Vice President of Ghana, who's also one of our board members, said once very memorably at an event that, uh, you know, a government is serious about data when it um, invests in data that tells, that tells it what it doesn't want to know. And I think it is, you know, this, uh, the willingness of governments to do things that, you know, that to be led, or at least to, to be informed by data um, and to recognize problems that perhaps are not at the top of their list when the data shows that they should be. So I think there's a whole series of question here about data use that I'd be really keen to, uh, to come to. Some of the barriers for use, we've talked already about capacity, about financing, about some of the institutional issues. Um, so Anna, Patricia, perhaps you could kick us off on this um, and then we can hear from the bank team um, next. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. So, yeah, because you did mention that some questions were there about capacity building, the, the um, concept of mentions it a little bit as well. And I think that's key. And I, I guess I would like to emphasize there's different levels at which the capacity building needs to happen. And that, for example, one key sector or key player, I think it's local governments. 
and I know it's very different in different places, but more and more local officials play a fundamental role. Like, and now with the pandemic in Ecuador, we have um, kind of a lighting system and local government officials have to make the decision about whether we go from red to, to yellow, et cetera. So uh, not only access to data, but how you even analyze the data. We've done a ton of uh, capacity building exercises with also students and universities. Uh, and I think um, putting a, an effort and, and funds and energy on those capacity building of public officials and, and policy makers is key. Some, some countries don't have the luxury of having a specific agency that does the analysis of the, of, or the data. And that's very important. And linked to that, it's that idea of um, evaluation. There is not a culture of evaluation. I'd love to see more impact evaluation, but even if, it's, if that's not possible because of the complexity and the methodology and the requirements, at least uh, um, results evaluation or process evaluation, I think that has to be embedded in the culture and that's part of the capacity building as well. And finally, on the data usability and accessibility, I think again, um, CSOs and, and NGOs are great partners in transforming data in something that is easier to consume that will help people make um, better decisions over time. Thanks very much. And a good reminder again that all of these things, you know, one of the themes for me of this session has been the kind of complexity of the landscape and the need to think through the engagement of many, many actors. Uh, some the obvious ones, but also some of the ones, you know, to really cast the net very wide in terms of who are the actors that we need to think about as participants in a data system that can really achieve all of the things that we collectively want it to achieve. Let me come back now to the bank team um, to talk to just tell us about how they're thinking through some of these big questions about data use. Um, and I guess also to, you know, perhaps if you would care to speculate at all about the way in which you, your strategy for making sure that the report itself is useful um, and uh, how you're going to be approaching the, the report's own impact um, and use. Thank you. I guess this one falls to me because my colleagues have already spoken. Um, so on data use, um, yes, there are, are many impediments to it. Um, you know, I think Claire, you mentioned and the discussion has mentioned, you know, government, there's the political economy angle here. And I think, um, you know, in the morning session, Aiden had this wonderful comment about, there seems to be an, a, a, an assumption lurking that the government is a benign neutral actor, a, a neutral arbiter of competing interests. And then I think later you said, Claire, yeah, is the government, is the government really a player or is it a referee? Um, and so I think we need to be attuned to those sorts of arguments. I think what's collected and shared is often a political decision. And uh, the amount uh, of openness that uh, countries um, care to have, the amount that they want to know. I mean, the, the quote from the Ghanaian prime minister is, is priceless. It gets right at it. If, when they're at a point when they, you're telling them something they don't want to know and they're willing to go for it, that's something. What we do in other contexts, it's hard to know what to do in the report except to identify that uh, really Aiden's point from the morning. You can't always assume a neutral arbiter role here. And when that happens, I think we have to fight, we need high, highlight examples of what can be done. Um, CSOs uh, can transform data and, and make it usable for the rest of society. That will increase transparency so that much of society can understand um, what needs to happen. You know, it's another source of data. It's another source of information. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, it was mentioned that um, in our current framework, we don't emphasize that sort of uh, the role of CSOs and citizen generated data. I think we need to be sensitive to that. We've gotten that out. And that is a check on a government that uh, for whatever set of reasons does not want to uh, collect a lot of data and share a lot of data. Uh, the capacity and the funding uh, arguments, uh, you know, uh, these, these are central. Deepa's point, unless you have people in the line ministries that have the technical capabilities to understand how to use these other data sources, um, and unless they're sufficiently senior, and unless there's funding in place for whatever coordinating agency uh, you use to implement a national data system, without those building blocks, you can't expect it to go well, and that will be an important part of the report. 
Uh, finally, one thing that we haven't talked about a lot yet is the capacity and the knowledge of the users of these services. Um, and so one thing that came up throughout in Anna's comments and then later Aiden brought up is about the financial services industry. And I think that's a particularly interesting one because there's an ability to leapfrog right now. Um, Anna alluded briefly to the uh, Portfolios of the Poor work, which was done uh, with one of my close co-authors, Jonathan Mordick. And what it showed was that uh, the takeaway for me was uh, because people are poor and they have irregular incomes, they have highly chaotic, complicated financial lives. Um, but the tools that are available to them are imperfect ones. And so they spend a lot of time um, trying to organize their financial lives when um, they could be doing other things. Um, and so I would say that these digital technologies and digital financial services um, are a way um, to maybe leapfrog. Um, and you see mobile money, uh, alternative credit scoring models, um, they're coming to the fore in many uh, developing economies right now. Um, and, but it's a perfect example because it, it illustrates the capabilities of those who are getting this credit now. They've never had credit before, and so they're becoming deeply indebted. And so we have to emphasize the risks and challenges on that side as well. Um, and then Aiden brings up a good point. Uh, they were excluded for so long. Now they have financial services, but all the rents being extracted from them as these algorithms figure out more and more about them. I think that speaks to things that Vivian had brought up about the absolute importance of competition um, in the delivery of these digital financial services. So again, I think that's a great example to re uh, that sort of brings together the capability on the user side and the protections that we need to worry about in terms of competition and knowledge uh, on the part of the users. So um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Uh, we probably don't have time to get into a discussion of it, but someone has just pointed out on the chat that uh, that um, digital services are not the same thing as data and that it perhaps, you know, one of the, it would be helpful to, um, to kind of clarify terms a little bit here. Quite often when we're talking about data, we sort of elide very quickly into digital services, but of course data is many things, not all of which are digital. Um, so we need to kind of, um, anyway, I know you know that. I just uh, thought it was, it was a, an interesting and useful reminder. Okay, we have um, just three minutes left, so probably not enough time to get into another question. Um, I would be really interested just as a closing uh, from the bank side to hear from you a sort of very short summary of what you want to happen after this report. You know, in two years time, if we all come back here and survey the data landscape, what are the things that you most want to have changed? How will you what will be the things that will tell you that your report succeeded? Thank you. And this is also your last word. <laughs> Nobody wants I'll to take, answer this question. Come well, on, I'll, guys. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take one crack, but I'll just, I'll make a narrow yeah. point. I think there'd be many things that we'd hope to see. I'll make one narrow point that I think links back to several of the questions. So, in fact, one of the very first comments was, um, viewing people as producers of data and not data consumers. I think if we're effective, and in, this goes also to data literacy and to this issue of equity, if, if we have the impact that we desire, this data that we're talking about, this healthy data environment, which means improved communication between NGOs, uh, NSOs, CSOs, and the people, means then that people know how to use the data in a way that they can more effectively advocate for themselves. And as they realize, if they get the skills in terms of using this data and digesting it, they'll start creating more demand for this data. And unless this demand for the data is created, you know, I think nothing we write will, will have the impact. So my, my hope is that in a few years from now that we have seen sort of a realization that this importance of data skills is really central to creating effective users of data and better communication, which goes back to Aiden's point that it's really about people. And in my mind, it's communication between people is what data is about, but, but it is centrally about people. So more effective advocates of their interests. 
Thank you so much. I think that was a great answer to a difficult question. And uh, and uh, no, thank you all for being incredibly open and engaged and interested. Um, thank you to our fantastic discussants, Aidan, Deepa and Anna Patricia. Really helpful comments. I hope you heard uh, how much we all engaged with your perspectives and comments. Thank you to everybody who has um, listened and participated on the Slido. We're going to pass, I am apologise that we couldn't get to all of your questions, but we are going to pass them all on to the team so that they can see the full range of questions um, and the various different concerns that were expressed um, during the, the discussion. Um, Please do continue to send in your thoughts to the bank team directly or via us at, uh, at Data for SDGs. The, um, the PowerPoint um, will be on the website, as we've just said, um, and the final report I think we can look forward to in January 2021. So thank you all hugely for, your, uh, for a really, really engaging discussion. Uh, very best of luck to all of you, to you with the writing and uh, look forward to more discussions and to reading the report. Thank you all. Bye.